All right. It's going to be different this morning. I like being down low. That way, if I see somebody sleeping, I can walk over and poke them. I'm just kidding. You just never know. All right. How's everybody doing this morning? You know, I don't know if you're like me, but I'm kind of shocked in some ways by some of the things that have happened in the you know, last four or five years, just how quickly things have been changing. And I know I've talked to with some other people, you know, just that sense of, well, wow, how did we get here all of a sudden? You know, things going on in our country, it's just kind of, kind of shocking at times. You know, if I go back 30 years, so think, you know, some of you that are under 30 can't do this, but think back to uh, the Reagan era, okay, and middle 80s. And it just seemed like, wow, things are, are really, uh, you know, looking up. You know, I mean, that was kind of the, the mood of the country. Things are looking up. We're back on track. And I know in the church, there was, you know, the whole moral majority movement. And they were asserting a lot of influence politically. Things were changing. And, it, you know, really kind of had that sense of, wow, this is good. We're going in the right direction again. And then, you know, the 90s happened. And then, I don't know, things just since then have have eaten away to the point where, you know, now we look at ourselves like, wow, how do we get here? You know, as a country, we've really, we've turned a lot of corners that I never would have thought we would have as a country. You know, things with, with uh, gay marriage and, and other things that just were really turned our back on the idea even of being a Christian nation. I don't think anybody would really argue that we are anymore, but uh, even that idea seems kind of foreign to us. My brother uh, texted me the other day after uh, the shooting at the, uh, the Naval Station or the Naval uh, Command Center there in Washington, D.C. And, you know, his comment was, just seems like half the, half the world's gone crazy. And, uh, you know, my thought was, he, he's probably being optimistic there. You know, because really it's probably more than half the world's gone crazy. We just see so much stuff going on. But the reality is, isn't that, you know, we're in a worse situation than we were before? Because in one sense, people have always been shrouded in darkness. You know, we're born into that place of, of just being uh, kind of in, in a, a dark world. Um, so I'm putting a, my uh, title slide up there. So my title this morning is uh, Finding Hope in a World at War with Itself. Um, you know, so it's not really, I don't think that, that things are getting worse in terms of the, the state of humanity, but that the expression of that darkness has gotten worse. And so I want to talk about that and how we can find hope in the midst of all that. So starting off, let's look at uh, Romans 121. Let me put the next slide up there, just give people a reference. So if you can open your Bibles with me to, uh, to Romans chapter 1. This is kind of a familiar scripture to, uh, to a lot of us, but uh, so Romans chapter 1, verse 21, and I'm going to read 21 through 24, and it says that, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over. I'm just going to stop there for a moment. And this is a scary idea here. But as a nation, we've really turned our back on God. And because of this, God has given us over to that that darkness of sin. Okay, now flip over to uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to look at verse 18. So Ephesians 4.18. And a similar thought here. It says, They're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. So again, this, this darkness we see in our culture, 
has a lot to do with the fact that we've chosen as a nation lust over God. And now when I say lust, I don't mean just in a sexual sense. It's really a lust for, for pleasure. It's a lust for, for things. It's a lust for power. It's a lust for whatever I want that's good for me. <clears throat> now, you know, really, and that's kind of the essence of our culture right now. And it's even been called the me culture, you know, or the me society. And, you know, it's fine, you know, because I realize it's all about me, but the problem is that you don't realize it's all about me. So that's where the trouble comes, right? Because, you know, if everybody just lived for me, then I'd be fine and it would all be good. But the problem is you're living for you and you're living for you and, and it just ends up being a, a real mess. And what we see is that this kind of culture, it becomes a, a hard place to live. You know, we look at that, that mass shooting that just took place, you know, and I don't know, we've had one or two a, a year now, it seems. You know, and our, our sense of shock and awe is kind of diminished. I know mine has, at least. You know, you hear it's like, oh, another one, you know. When it first happened, I remember Columbine a number of years back. You know, it was just like, it was just so unbelievable that some, something like that could happen. And now it's like, oh, you know, another one happened. You know, we just kind of lose that sense of, of shock over it. You know, and now it just turns into a political debate about gun control. And you got the one side, you know, saying, you know, the problem is we've got too much access to guns. We need to get rid of all the guns and then everything would be safe. You know, and of course, that's fine except for the fact that, uh, you know, then only some people have guns and it's not always the right people have guns. You know, and our, our founding fathers, they said, well, you know what, if we took all the guns away, then the people who have guns are going to control the place. And so they said, that's not a good idea. So they created the Second Amendment, which was a good idea, I think. But you know what, the other side of the debate is everybody carries a gun, and then you can at least defend yourself. But that really doesn't attack the core issue, which is the fact that you have people whose hearts have turned, you know, in a way that they want to take another life, even a senseless act of violence that... You know, it's like, I don't even know these people. I'm just going to kill them just for something to do. I mean, it's just weird. It's just sad. It's just, you know, it just shows how, how dark and, and, and far down we've, we've dropped as a culture. But we need to recognize that unless we understand things from God's viewpoint, it, it doesn't make sense. But when we see things from God's viewpoint, then we know how to deal with it. So first of all, we really have to recognize that the world... All of us were initially born in darkness. We already touched on this issue that we have a dark heart, and the reality is we're born in that condition. So flip over to Romans chapter 5. So back to Romans. And verse 12. Okay, so if we look at uh, Romans 5.12, it says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and this way death came to all men, because all sinned. So this is a fundamental idea here, that death entered in through sin, because Adam sinned, death entered the world, and that sin was accounted to all the world, and all men, all women, all humanity, was under that curse of sin because of Adam's sin. It also transmitted to us a heart that's just wanting to sin. So now, flip back to Romans chapter 1, in verse 24. So we were here earlier. We're going to pick up in 24. It says, Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. 
They disobey their parents. They are sense, senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. This is quite a list. You know, when you read this, it's like, okay, it's like you're reading the paper. You know, it's like things that are going on right in our day and age. Now, the interesting thing about this is this is not written as a prophecy of what's to come in the end times. This is what Paul was writing about the people of his day. And the point is that this is the state of human, this is the human condition as we're born. Without Christ, we are in this state. And we have all this ability to do all these things on this list of disobedience from disobeying your parents, which, you know, you might not think that's a big deal, to being a murderer. All those things are in the same category. They all come to the same place. Now, the thing we're seeing in our culture, I think, is because darkness is just becoming more and more rampant, we have a, an acceleration of that darkness. Okay? In our schools, we're, we're teaching kids you know, that they're the product of chance. We're not teaching them that they're you know, a, a child of God. We're not teaching them basic principles of, of God's law, so they don't have that. We see in their movies, you know, just this greater sense of, of darkness and evil. We see in our video games, you know, just a lot of, of this stuff. And it just accelerates what's already there, makes it more and more prevalent. Sometimes, you know, I've heard Christians, and I, you know, and I think it's, you know, something we, we think sometimes just to make ourselves feel better. We say, well, at least in, in some ways it's good because now we know where people are at. You know, there's no gray area whether you're a Christian or not. It's like you either are or you're not, and it's a pretty, pretty definitive line. But the reality, the other side of that coin, I think, is that as we reach out into this culture, we've got to have the, the expectation that it's going to be hard work. That every person that comes in, you know, is going to have things that they're dealing with because of the brokenness of our culture. I mean, I don't think we have to even describe, you know, what it looks like out there. Those of you, you all know situations where people are just so broken, you know, and the families with, uh, you know, violence, sexual abuse, emotional abuse. People are carrying around a lot of hurts, you know, drug addiction, pornography addiction, all these things. You know, and our younger generation, you know, the young, a lot of the young guys are just being, just born into this, you know, lustful, porn, pornographic culture. And it's going to be really rough as they grow up how they're going to treat their wives and such forth. So all these things, you know, we need to understand we can have an impact, but it's going to be at a price. It's not going to be easy for us to impact this world. Because if we're going to change our culture, we've got to change the hearts of people first. There's nothing we can do on the outside that's going to make a difference. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't still be somewhat involved politically. I think we should. And I'll tell you why. Again, the more you can restrain the forces of evil, you're protecting people you know, from being in a place of being you know, destroyed. And so I, I, I'm not at all advocating, you know, don't vote or you know, whatever. I think we've got to stay involved. But the reality is that God is judging sin continuously. And the judgment of sin often comes in its own consequences. So broken families produce you know, situations that are just harmful and hurtful. And one day, I don't know, God may bring a cataclysmic judgment upon this nation. You certainly could justify it by some of the things that we've done as a nation. But as the church, we're here to call the world to a place of hope, to a place of restoration. And I think the answer really is for the church to be who God has called us to be. So, I want to give uh, credit to a, a short book uh, by Guy Erwin Lutzer. I don't know if you ever hear him on the radio. But uh, he's got a book that's called Where Do We Go From Here? Hope and Direction in Our Present Crisis. And he has these uh, five pillars, unshakable truths, that we can have hope in as we look at how we're going to impact the world around us. Because really, we are at a time of crisis. I mean, I think if we're, we're honest here, we're in a crisis in our country. It's a crisis of faith. It's a crisis of who we are as a, as a, as a nation. And we really have to, to take seriously the times we live in. So the first, uh, first truth here is that God still reigns. Again, we've been given leaders in our nation. And, and you know, we take 
opportunity to pray for them every week. You know, and we're, we're praying for God to, to change their hearts and direct their hearts so that we can have peace in this time. But you know what? Sometimes we get leaders that are a reflection of who we are. Think back to the, the nation of Israel. So when, when uh, the nation of Israel, they, they wanted a king. And they said, God, we want to be a king so we can be like all the other nations. So when we go out to war, we got a king to lead us and all these things. And so God gave them the desire of their heart. And it was a king that w- was in a lot of ways just like them. Because he was more interested in, in what other people thought than what God thought. And he was weak in that area. And so what happened? He, he ended up... He ended up messing up, and he ended up leading the nation astray because of his, his disobedience to God. So when we get, a na- we get a leader in our nation who's not leading us in the right direction, a lot of times it's because we as a nation have reflected that. That's where we are. But here's the good news. God is still in charge. And God can even use ungodly leaders to accomplish his purposes. Again, the nation of Israel... They had all kinds of bad leaders. But eventually, they did accomplish one of their main purposes, which was to bring about Jesus Christ as their Messiah, that Jewish Messiah, Jesus. He was one of the ultimate purposes for the nation of Israel. And that happened, just as God wanted it to, just as God had foretold, just as he had prophesied for years and years and years and centuries that he was coming. So God's purposes will always be carried out regardless of who's on the throne in whatever place. Let's look at another example in Isaiah 44. Um, So if you want to turn there to Isaiah 44 and verse 24. So Isaiah, kind of in the middle of your Bible there, pretty close to the middle. And uh, this is a prophecy that's given during a time of uh, captivity. So again, if you remember your, your history, the, the people of Judah, they were, they were taken into captivity because of their disobedience to God. And the temple in Jerusalem was torn to the ground. Things were pretty bad. They were pretty, pretty much you know, in a place of being uh, without a country, without hope. And God sends this, this prophecy through Isaiah. So in Isaiah 44, 24, it says this. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord who has made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who foils the signs of the prophets, of false prophets, and makes fools of diviners, who overthrows the learning of the wise and turns it into nonsense. I I just love the way that starts. You know, I'm God. I made everything. Some people think they're smart. They're not. That's, you know, the... That's my paraphrased version, okay? Who carries out the words of his servants and fulfills the predictions of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, it shall be inhabited, of the towns of Judah, they shall be built, and of their ruins, I will restore them. Who says to the watery deep, be dry, and I will dry up your streams. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. Okay, who's Cyrus? Anybody remember who Cyrus was? He's king of Persia. So he was not, you know, a godly man. He was not a man that was following the ways of God. But God worked through Cyrus to bring about the restoration of the temple, the restoration of the city of Jerusalem, and the people re-inhabiting the land of Israel. So Cyrus was, in this scripture, Isaiah says, Cyrus is God's shepherd. I mean, that's, I just think that's so crazy that God would say, this ungodly king is my shepherd to do my will. So how does that work? Well, God is God. He stretched out the heavens. He will do what he wants to do. It doesn't matter who is on the throne. It doesn't matter who is in charge. What God's purposes are will be accomplished in God's time in his way. And that's such an unshakable truth that we need to hang on to, that no matter what the circumstances are around us, God is still in charge. And yeah, boy, you know, I wish, I wish so much that our country was a godly nation and that people would return to him because it does have impact. People are, you know, so 
broken, so hurting right now because of the direction our country's going. I want it to change. But I know that God has his purposes, and they will be accomplished no matter where America ends up. So, a quote from Erwin Lutzer, he says, We are called for this moment, and therefore we must remember that the task ahead of us is never as great as the power behind us. Let me read that again. We are called for this moment, and therefore we must remember that the task ahead of us is never as great as the power behind us. So let's keep that in mind. Okay, the second, second unshakable truth here is that Jesus loves the church. You know that Jesus established this church because that was his way of working in the world since the time he left till the time he returns. He says, I've established my church. So let's look at uh, 1 Peter 2.9. So 1 Peter 2.9 is where we're at. And it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. This is a cool scripture. It's got a lot of stuff in it. It says, first of all, that God chose us. So, you know, we didn't choose God. We didn't say, God, I think you should make a church, and I think you should do, do it like this. No. God says, I'm going to call you out of the world, out of the darkness, into the light, and I'm going to make you my church. I'm going to make you my people. It says we are a royal priesthood. Rayo mentioned it earlier when we were praying. We have 24-7 access to the throne room of God. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit in you, you have that access all the time. You are a royal priest, which means you are a king and a priest. And that's really, this whole scripture, I may have to preach on that for 45 minutes, but I don't have much time. But this is such an awesome idea that we have all the rights of a son, all the access of a priest. I mean, it's just an amazing thing. It also says that, uh, that we're a holy nation. It means we're set apart from God. Again, God has called us out of the darkness into the light. And God wants us to be light. God wants us to be set apart, holy, distinct, different from the world. Now, that doesn't mean we have to act different, because if we're just ourselves, we will be different, okay? But God wants us to really be a holy people. And we're God's people. We belong to him. We don't belong to ourselves anymore. We belong to, to Jesus now, here's the thing. If we are truly holy people, we will make people in the world uncomfortable. Just by our very nature, being who we are in Christ will make people uncomfortable. It will make people in the world who love darkness greater than light not like us. It's just going to happen. Quoting Lutzer again, he says, The church is to be in the world as a ship is in the ocean. And I like that, that analogy, okay? So we are like a ship on the ocean. Now what happens when the ocean gets into the ship? Think Titanic. Not good, right? Okay? <laughs> Not a good scene, okay? We're all clinging for, for sheets of uh, broken wood or something. We don't want to be an imitation of the world. The church is not called to reach the world with worldly methods. The church is not called to reach the world through political systems of the world. The church is called to reach the world by being the church. And we've kind of, I think, you know, again, I think our church is great. I mean, I, I love a lot of stuff about our church. The church in America on, on whole, though, has really lost a lot of its, its punch, a lot of its voice, because it's trying to be something that it was never called to be. Now, Back in the early days of the church, first, second century, Christians had no influence. They were the refuse of society. They were not people in political positions. They were not privileged with any kind of freedom. But yet, they affected slow and continual change over the, the, their culture through their beliefs and their behaviors. Another quote here, it says, The consistent lesson of 2,000 years of church history 
is that the church does not need freedom to be faithful. So our calling has nothing to do with our position politically. It has to do with who we are as individuals and living that out faithfully. And that brings me to my third point, which is that our mission is unchanged. So if we want to flip over to the next slide there. We look at what uh, Paul has to say about, about our mission. So go ahead, go to the next one. There we go. So starting in 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, Paul says this to the Corinthian church. Now, again, Corinth was a city known for prostitution. That was actually a, another name for a prostitute was a Corinthian. Not a nice place. It was a very secular city. And Jesus, or, uh, Paul said this, that for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So what's his message to a pagan world? Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, he goes to Galatia, okay, so the letter to the Galatians. And Paul says, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Okay, the next slide. We're going to, to Philippi. So all these were pagan cities. These were not in the, the land of Israel. These churches were formed from people that did not know God. It says, what is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. There's only one message that can transform lives. And the only way we can transform our culture is to transform the individual lives. And that message is simple. It is that Jesus died for sinners, of which I am the worst. And that, if we have that in our hearts in a true way, that we recognize the humility we have to have because God has saved us. That, you know, we're not something special. It's not because, you know, I have really got it together that Jesus saved me. It's because I really needed Jesus that he saved me. And, you know, that compassion that flows from a heart of understanding how desperately we need Christ will be the same compassion that leads us to take that message to other places that really can make an impact. Faith in Christ can change anyone. That is our message. And it has to be an exclusive message. You know what? It is a hard thing. Like they said on that video, that 50% of evangelical Christians think there are other ways to get, get saved other than Christ. How can that be in America that we have lost that idea that Jesus is the only way? The church is not doing its job if half the people in the churches think that it's not the only way. Another thing we need to remember, too, is we can't just, you know, I've heard the expression, we just need to love on people. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. We do need to love on people. That's part of our, our preaching the gospel. But it can't stop there because the message of the cross is what Paul said. I want to know nothing among you except the message of the cross, that Christ died for your sins. He died and he rose again. And he, and he ascended on the, onto the right hand of the Father. And now he sent his Holy Spirit so we can have that in our hearts. And he wants that for you if you repent and turn and follow him. Okay, next point. We must recognize our mission is only going to be as successful as our lives. We all know we've heard, you know, that, uh, you know, there's hypocrites in the church and that's why people don't, don't want, to, want to listen to it. Uh, Erwin Lutzer has this quote. He says, Humanly speaking, there may be powerful reasons why the world does not believe our message. And that's kind of, kind of hurts when you think about that. But there's probably very good reasons why people in the world look at Christians and say, why should I believe what you're teaching me because you're no different than the rest of us. You're just a bunch of hypocrites. The lifestyle of many in the church, unfortunately, is the same as those in the world. It's often hard to see a difference. 
And unfortunately, that includes some very high-profile church, church leaders. And also, a lot of times, we don't effectively preach and teach the truth of sin and love at the same time. For example, think of Westboro Baptist. How many of you guys have heard of those guys? They're the ones who, who go and like, they, they protest at funerals for servicemen. I don't know what's up with those guys, okay? I don't think they're on the right track, okay? There's something wrong in their, their theology because I don't know why they think they can be so rude and so uh, just, uh, they're just whacked, okay? They, they were protesting out in Prescott, Arizona, where my brother lives, where, you know, 19 firemen died in a, fighting a wildfire. I mean, why they think that's necessary? It just doesn't make any sense. They, they might have some truth there, but there's no love. On the other hand, we got guys like Rob Bell out there now who's saying, oh, love wins. We don't have to teach them about hell anymore because God's going to save them all anyway. You know, no, that's not the gospel. The gospel is only by the name of Christ shall men be saved. And we have to hang on to both the love for people and the fact that it's a hard message. And yeah, it's going to divide people. Jesus even said, I came to set members of their own family one against one another because his message is divisive. When you say, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, it sets a divide that cannot coexist with everything else. You're saying, this is it. You know, if I make a way through these chairs, I've divided them, I've made a way, but there's only one way. I can crawl across the chairs if I want, but that's not the way. So we need to have the humility that says, I'm a sinner, just saved by, by grace. I'm so glad that I am. Uh, but also have the guts to stand in a world that doesn't want to hear a, a divisive message and say, Christ is the only way. It wasn't my, I didn't say that, he did. <laughs> you know, just point back to Jesus. Say, it's his words, not mine. I didn't make this up. You know, I would love to say, hey, everybody's saved. Just go out and have fun. I mean, how much easier would that gospel message be? But it's not. That's not what God, God prescribed. So, let's go back to the first century. In North Africa, Christians, again, they were, they were not in any place of influence. But you know the way that they buried their dead began to make an impact on the way people viewed Christianity? Because they believed in the resurrection. They said, God's going to come back, and all these bodies are going to come back so we're not going to just burn them. We're going to give them a decent burial so their, their body can, can resurrect again. The plagues hit. They began to care for, you know, the dead who were just being cast aside because they said even, even the pagans deserve a decent burial. People were abandoning babies, and they set up uh, ministries, for lack of a better word, where they'd, they'd take these abandoned babies and they'd find mothers who could nurse them where others would just, you know, turn their eyes and, and, and not, not care. So they had this, this sense of just, I'm going to do what's right, no matter what. And what happened was they began to influence the culture. People began to notice that. Let's go back to 1 Peter ch chapter 2, verse 9. I don't know if I have that one up here. And again, we already read that you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had received mercy, but now you have, or once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Verse 11, dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So the situation we're finding ourselves in America as the church today is not new. It's as old as the New Testament. We're just not used to living in a pagan nation because, you know, we grew up in a time when, when America had, a, had some Christian roots. But as we become more and more of a pagan nation, we just go back and look at, you know, the letters that were written in the New Testament, and it's almost exactly the situation we find ourselves in. 
So we shouldn't really be surprised that these things happen. We shouldn't really be, uh, you know, distraught. I mean, again, yes, I am distraught for our nation. Yes, I want it to change. But it's nothing new. What do we do about it? We live such good lives among the pagans. So you're at work with pagans. Live such a good life that they take notice. And then when you get the chance, use your words to teach them about the cross. Okay. So, we, uh, we've got to live the lives that reflect our message. We've got to strengthen our families, too. This has always got to be a foundational thing. We've got to always be strengthening our families. And you know what? I'm a big proponent of Christian education. And I know there's people that, uh, you know, they do okay in, in the secular schools, and that's, that's great. You know, and I, I just know it's a lot more work for a parent to, to teach, you know, what's right as well as unteach what, what might be being taught that's wrong. But you know what? The family has got to be a foundation of the church. Fathers, teach your children. Parents, teach your children. Teach them in the ways of the Lord. You know what? As the family is strong, the church is strong. And as the church is strong, the family is strong. There are two fundamental things that God has established that have to work together. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But really, you know, parents, just take that as, no matter what's going on in the world, it is your responsibility to teach your children the ways of the Lord. Husbands, learn to love your wives the way Christ loved the church. Wives, respect your husbands. These things are really just so important to our mission. Third point here is we must learn again to be lovingly confrontational and persuasive. Some of us love to be confrontational, but we need to be both loving and persuasive in our confrontation. So, we're going to look at uh, 1 Peter 3.15. It says, uh, But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. So we need to have the ability to give an answer for the hope that we have. And this is a command of Scripture. Do you ever think about that? I mean, we like to think, well, somebody else can, you know, give the answer. You know, that, leave that to the, the people on the radio who, who have a good voice and all that kind of stuff. But all of us are commanded to be able to give the reason for the hope that we have. Do you know that I believe firmly that Christianity is superior to every other view that's out there? I have no doubt in my mind. Okay, you, you know, if you come to me and say, why do you think that, uh, you know, God designed everything instead of evolution? I can give you an answer. I can go on for hours on that one. You ask me why, you know, is it important that abortion, why do we always talk about abortion and, and rights for, you know, uh, the elderly and things like that? It's because God has a dignity placed on every human person, and we can't mess with that. You know, sexual purity... That's an area where Christianity is so different from the rest of the world. But you know what? It's better. It's better than the alternative. And I can give you reasons for that. How about male-female roles? You know, in the world, it's, it's all about competition. Women have got to be better. You know, I can do anything better than you. Um, so anyway, um, but you know what? God's way says, no, men and women are complementary. They're not the same. He didn't design us the same. And he did that on purpose. It wasn't an accident. And they work together when we, when we do it right. And it's, and it's a beautiful thing. God has given us a work ethic. Right, Paul? Amen. Work is not just something that fell in the curse that we have to deal with. It's something that God gave us to do. It's part of who we are. All kinds of things. I bore you with my list here. But anyway, the, the whole thing is that Jesus has given us hope, and he's given us life, and he's given us his word. And we have all this stuff. We have to be able to say, yeah, I have reasons for why I believe the way I believe. And when people look at our lives, we can give them those reasons. So we have to be, we have to be able to persuade people lovingly. 
We have to be able to confront the lies lovingly, persuasively, also with a life that lines up with that. Okay. So be ready. It's a command. Not mine. It's from, from God. Okay. Point four. Our focus is on the eternal kingdom of God. So God still reigns. Jesus loves the church. Our mission is unchanged. And our focus is on the eternal kingdom. You know, so much of how we live is dependent on what we think is real. You know, if, if we focus on, you know, this is what's really important, you know, that's, that's what drives us. We've got to get back to an idea that this world is temporary. Think of camping. How many of you camped? I mean, camping's fun, you know. And, like, when we camp, you know, we, we had some years where it just rained like crazy. And so we got really good at camping in the rain. We'd set up these tarp cities, and, you know, we'd have, have them angled just right so we could, you know, have a fire under there and, and still cook under there and not get wet. And, you know, just you learn all the little tricks, you know, how to keep the mud out of your, out of your, out of your tent and all that. So we did some effort to make it comfortable, but we never put a foundation down. We never poured footers and built buildings when we were camping because we were camping. We were only going to be there for, you know, a few days. So you did things that were temporary. And it's kind of like that in this world. It's temporary. So we do some things. Yeah, we've got to work. We, we build houses so we have a place to, you know, keep the, the rain off our heads. But it's temporary. We're not going to be here forever. Jesus is coming back. He's going to bring with him the everlasting kingdom, the new heavens, the new earth, and we'll be there forever. So we need to keep that in perspective. The things that we're dealing with now are temporary. There was a lady in the uh, 1950s. Her name was Florence Chadwick. She was a swimmer, and she tried to swim the English Channel. And first time she tried... You know, it was a real foggy day. It was cold. And after about 15 hours, she, she gave up. And she asked him to pull her up into the boat. She realized at that point she was only a half mile from the shore. So she was almost there. And she was like, ah, oh, if I would have known I was that close, I could have kept going. Two years later, she tried again. And this time, even though the conditions were the same, it was still cold and foggy, she knew not to give up. And she completed it. We have to have that perspective of how close we are to that shore. You know, and not give up in our fight that, yeah, this, this life can be tough sometimes, but we're so close. We're so close to that next thing that God's going to do. We're so close to his breakthrough in our lives. We're so close to him coming back and just changing all this to be perfect again. Don't ever let the perspective of the here and now take away from what's ahead. Because God... He's going to win. If you're still in 1 Peter, flip over to chapter 4 now. Chapter 4 and verse 12. And Peter has some, some good words here. He says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial that you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of, gl- of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should be not as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal, or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. So Peter, again, hitting this theme, you're suffering, Don't, don't give up. Continue to do good. Commit yourself to the creator. So where did we ever get this idea that serving God was supposed to be easy? I mean, where did that come from? 
Because I think most American Christians, to some degree or another, are deluded by that thought. I know I have been at times. When things get hard, you're kind of like, gee, God, this is hard. Why is this so hard? But you know what? Scripture does not bear this out, that serving God is easy. It's worth it. It's joyful. It's good. Easy? No. And I really want to challenge you guys, and maybe some of you young guys there. I want to challenge you guys. Serving God is hard. And we need people that are willing to do the hard work. If we're going to make an impact in this world, it's going to be hard. We're going to, we're going to bring people in that, you know, they're going to have all kinds of th- issues that we need to help them work through. We're going to have times when we are ridiculed for our faith. We're going to have times when we have to give up the things that, that you know, we want to do to serve somebody else. We have to be willing to do the hard work if we're going to make an impact in this world. And I really challenge you guys, you know, group of young people sitting there, you know, don't be afraid to sacrifice your life to serve God. It's worth it. And we need sacrifice. You know, it's, it's a sacrifice of love. It's because we love God. It's because of what he's done for us. Look at what Paul did. You know, he didn't, you know, complain about the sacrifice he made. He talked about being poured out like a drink offering for the, the service of the church. It was what God called him to do, and he gladly ran that race. And that's what I want my testimony to be, that I ran the race and I finished it, even though it was hard. Speaking of finishing, I'm getting close. Um, last point is that God is still at work. You know, it's never too late. This world no matter how bad it gets, even this country, no matter how, how bad it gets, it's never too late for God to turn it around. Because all it takes is repentance. As people just turn to God in repentance, He can make a change. There's been two or three great awakenings in this nation in the past, where you know, the nation on large numbers just turned back to God. This thing that Billy Graham organization is putting together, maybe it's a great opportunity for us to see you know, a move of God start again. Let's really be praying that God would move in this nation to change it, to bring hearts back to him, to, to humble the Christians to return to him first, that Christians would grab onto the truth of the gospel and not say we're going to change it to make it more likable, but say, no, we're going to be more like the gospel so that people can change to it. That's what we need. Matthew 16, 8, Jesus said, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Jesus has built the church. It will prevail. He will win. No questions. We have to have faith that that is the truth. And whether our nation turns back around or not, we don't know that. But we do know that we can be faithful to what he's called us to do. I love this quote by Peter Marshall. It says, It's better to fail at a cause that will ultimately succeed than to succeed in a cause that will ultimately fail. So whether our immediate part, we see success or failure, doesn't matter. We're a part of a a cause that will succeed. We can have 100% confidence in that. So, it might mean, you know, if if this nation keeps going the way it's going, that we become, you know, a darker land. Our lives will not be as, as peaceful and enjoyable as they might have been otherwise. But we still have to be faithful to our calling. And God is calling us to be a part of his kingdom and to live a life that, that lives up to his, his calling as a holy nation so we can make an impact in this world. Please don't be afraid to get your hands out there and get dirty to make a difference in this world because God is calling us to do that. And yeah, it's going to be hard, but it's so worth it. Because one day he's going to come back. He's going to gather us all up, and we'll all be together with him for eternity, and it's going to be awesome. And there's going to be nothing like it. And, you know, the little taste we get here even is just so good compared to what the rest of the world has. Let's share that, and let's not be afraid of what, what might come against us as we stand up for the truth. Amen? 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 Amen. <laughs> 
All right, let's pray. God, we just thank you that, uh, that you are victorious, God. You've already won the victory. Um, Jesus, you are at the right hand of the Father, high and exalted. and it's, it's a done deal. Jesus, we just look forward to that day when you will come back, and, and God, you will set all things right. But Lord, we know that you are waiting because you're calling people into that kingdom still. And you're waiting for those doors to close so as many people as, as you've called can come in. Jesus, I pray that you would help us to just be confident in you. Lord, as we see crazy things happening around us in the world, that we would just run to you in confidence. And Lord, that we would see things as you see it, that we might just have your power behind us as we go into this world to, to bring hope to every person that we meet. And Jesus, you're not done with us. If you were done, we, we would be out of here. But God, you've, you've left us here to do your work. Father, we pray for this city again, that you would help us to make a change here, that we would be bold with your gospel, unashamed of its divisive truth, but full of love and compassion because you have just made us, taken, taken us out of the dirt and, and cleaned us off, God. And, and we just want to be people that reach back into that, that place where we once were. God, help us to be your hands and feet. Lord, give us hope that no matter what, you are in control. And we just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If anybody has anything you'd like prayer for, you're welcome to come forward. And otherwise, we'll see ya.